Hey everyone, it's Norm from Tested and welcome to Projections, our show about all things virtual reality. It's our 100th episode and a very special episode indeed because I'm here in Bellevue, Washington at the offices of Valve. Because yes, we are gonna be talking about Half-Life Alex today. I've played about three hours of the game Unfortunately, I can't talk about plot details, some of the mechanics, because they're still working on the game. There are things that are not final yet, like performance, like user interface, and like the control scheme. And that's gonna be interesting for this game, because not only will it, of course, support the Valve Index and the Valve Index controllers, but Valve is also intending for this game to be played on the widest range of PC-based VR headsets with motion controls as possible. And that's why I'm here today. Valve invited me up to try and test Half-Life Alex, the current build on headsets ranging from things that people may already have out there, like the HTC Vive or the original Oculus Rift, to headsets that people may be looking to buying, like the Oculus Quest, and even things like the Pimax or the Samsung Odyssey Plus. And to help me with that testing, we're going a little bit old school. I've brought in the help of Tested co-founder and my original cohort in VR coverage, Will Smith. Will, how are you doing? I'm doing great. So you Funny meeting you here, Norm. Yeah, good to see you here too. Ready to play some Half-Life Alex? Always. All right, let's get started. All right, so Will, at this point, we've played about three hours of the game. Some of us played four. <laughs> We're not doing an evaluative review or impressions yet, but I'm feeling pretty good. The, the amount and quality of art in this game is astounding. Like everything, you can interact with so much stuff, you can force pull it over to you, you can, the verbs that are accessible to you as a player are, are amazing, and the sound is spectacular. There's dynamic sound all around you, you hear things above and below you, and the levels are vertical and expansive. I, I've been thrilled so far. I mean, undoubtedly the game is high production value. It's a rich world that they've put a ton of resources into, which gives us a good place to start in our evaluation for the headset, because the headsets themselves have different displays, lenses, optics, field of view, and we wanna make sure that whether a headset is a relatively low resolution or high resolution, we can still make out that detail. Well, and even the parts of the game that we've seen in just the first three hours, there's places that are very, very dark, there's places that are very bright. There's some places that have light interspersed with dark, and how the headsets handle that with the different display technology, with, for example, the compression on the Oculus Link cable with the Quest, is really important to your impact, you know, your experience with the game. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the things I'm definitely gonna be looking for. Right, the Half-Life games are about exploration, about puzzle solving, and about combat. And specifically with the combat encounters, there's close quarters combat, there are engagements in these arena parts of the, the game where you're shooting at combine soldiers from across the map. And I'm curious about, you know, whether you can make out those soldiers and hit like their weak spots. Well, and, and unlike a lot of the first gen VR games, you know, this game has iron sights. So you, you have iron sights, you have to be able to see those iron sights, see the target beyond it, and line it all up in all of the headsets in order for that stuff to work well. Yeah. So I, I'm interested to see how that stuff plays as well. Yeah, something that's also incredibly powerful VR is also sound design. It, it's and, the cue that the developers have to tell you where to look. Right. So it's incredibly important. And there's dialogue in this game. You know, you, you, you as Alex, you hear Alex talk as well as the people that Alex engages mm -hmm. with. And the headsets differ in terms of the sound options. Some have built in headphones, some like the Quest and the Rift piped audio here with the option to use headphones. So we want to get a sense of how that experience works. How the default works. Obviously, for anything you plug headphones and you can put whatever headphones you want on, I want to know how the defaults work. Yeah, now we said we played about three to four hours of the game and those were continuous play sessions. Uh, we were using the Valve Index for that first playthrough and we were in there for a long time. Com comfort is really important. I was play I played at one point, I looked up and I, I asked how long I'd been playing and they said an hour and a half. I didn't even notice. Time went so fast when I was in the game. You want the headset to be comfortable so you can have those long sessions. Because it is, I think they said a 15 hour game-ish, depending on how you play. So, you know, you don't want to have a pain in the neck from 
playing. Totally. Out. Some some VR games are designed for short play sessions, mm -hmm. and you can certainly play this game. Feels like in short play sessions, mm -hmm. but we want it to continue. And undoubtedly, there'll be a lot of you out there who want to just play through as much many hours as possible. And the headsets differ in terms of weight distribution, how the ergonomics work, and how it's actually strapped to your head. And so that's something we'll be looking out for. Where the pressure rests it makes well. such a big difference. Yeah, and tracking volume matters, mm -hmm. and the headsets also differ in terms of how they can track your controllers and you. So the inside out headsets obviously have a disadvantage here because they're limited to where the cameras can see. So you know anything behind your head, behind your back is gonna be out of range. And some of the mechanics in the game, for example, the reload, you reach over your shoulder, you grab a magazine, you drop the magazine from your old gun, you slam it in, you rack the slide either with the button or by sliding it with the other controller, mm -hmm. which also is important because if the yeah. controller heads are too big, you can't get close enough to do it or the hand has to snap or there's some software magic that happens. And then you're back to shooting again. Yeah. And you know, when the zombies are coming at you and head crabs jumping at you, when the combine are shooting at you, you have a split second, and eventually you'll pick up the muscle memory to do that. It took me anywhere from an hour, maybe an hour and a half to get comfortable reloading on the fly. But you have to be able to do that stuff really, really quickly, and any misses mean you're gonna have to reload your save and, and you know, start again at the last checkpoint. You mentioned iron sights as something this game has, and it's something that for uh, headsets that use inside-out tracking, we're especially cognizant of, because if you're using two hands, the pose of your two hands to hold them like a pistol, mm -hmm. you wanna make sure that there's no occlusion between the controllers. The fact that the cameras can see both controllers, so you don't see one kind of float off in the distance, and also how close you can bring those iron sights to where your eyes are as you want to look down you know, the barrel. Well, and it also matters, especially for the inside out headsets like the Quest, the Rift S, and the, and the, um, the, the Windows MR headsets, how it handles the loss of tracking. You know, does it shift back to the IMU? Does it let you guess where, when, you're, when your hand's out of sight? Or does it just fail when you try to do that? I'm, I'm gonna be testing that stuff for sure. You know, we talked a lot, we mentioned a lot of the motion controllers, and that may be the most important differentiating factor between the headsets, because motion controls is one of the things that makes VR gaming so unique. The fact that you have not only this hand presence of moving things around, interacting with the world, using your firearm, but that they've designed this physics-based world where that's highly encouraged and two-hand interactions, like reloading, is an essential part of the game design. There's a high cognitive load to playing this game. You, know, you're, you have a lot of stuff to think about. You have to think about your position in the world, where the enemies are, whether there's enemies in the room, and then you know, constantly checking your ammo, checking your, your, the status of your player. So you, know, you have to be able to do that stuff without having to think about the controllers losing tracking or the controllers floating off in space or even which buttons are which. Totally. And, and I'm, I'm interested to see how the different controls map, especially down to things like the MVP, the minimum viable product, the, which is probably the Vive wand if I had to guess, mm -hmm. with the trackpad, you know, a couple of buttons and then the weird grips and the trigger. I mean, it's no surprise to say that physics are a big part of this game. And one of the things that was shown in the trailer are these gravity gloves that you as, as Alex had that give you essentially the equivalent of like these force powers. And the way that works is you can kind of point your finger at the world at objects they highlight you pull, which is the trigger or the grip button as a grab. Depends on the controller, I believe. And you can pull to you, yeah. and they've done some algorithmic work to make that object come to you to a place where you can easily snatch that out of the air. It feels very satisfying. Mm -hmm. It's funny, it's, a, it's the, I think the one place that I've noticed them doing VR magic to cheat and make it a little bit easier on the player, definitely when you do that grab, the point it requires a level of precision that's, that's pretty high. But once you lock onto it, the, the object highlights orange, you can kind of yank it back either with like a linear straight pull or like a wrist flick or there's any number of things you can do. It zooms back and it gets to where you can grab it really easily. Then when you throw, the release is lovely. Like it is, it is just, throwing in VR is hard because it's hard to tell the player's intent from the release of an analog trigger or a grip because they don't always hit the button at the time that they need to actually release it to throw the object where they want it to go. And they're doing a really good job interpolating or taking the information that they have from the hand movement, your head position, where you're looking, and getting a throw that feels very realistic. In, in VR, at least with index controllers. Absolutely, if you're doing holding a gas canister and you want to throw it to you know, a barnacle mm -hmm. to, to grab it, it, it needs to work most of the time. Yeah. Um, and there are two-handed objects that you're picking up. If you're pulling a crate to you and slamming it on the ground, you're you know opening a door, the door opening mechanism Pushing it. Yeah. has to work with all the different type of controller configurations and ergonomics, frankly, of the controllers, and that's something we'll be looking deep into. Two-handed interactions are something I haven't seen in a lot of VR games where you actually, if an object is too heavy for you to pick it up, you'll be able to maybe move it with one hand, you have to bend over and grab it with both hands, which is amazing. I mentioned they did cheat on the force pull, 
it seems like they're not cheating on auto aim. Yeah, they're hit scan weapons, there's no auto aim, and that will make the manipulation of these firearms in close quarter combat and at a distance really important so it's not unsatisfying if you suddenly lose tracking uh, as you're holding the pistol in front of you. Uh, lots to consider, um, and we're gonna start with our baseline VR headset, which is the Valve Index. Sounds good. So we're starting off with the Valve Index, which is what we used to play through our play session yesterday. The vast majority, yeah. Yes, uh, the headset is, in my opinion, one of the most comfortable headsets. It was didn't feel like a long, exhausting play session. And the visual fidelity, you know, they're using two high-resolution panels. They're LCD panels, but they're full RGB stripe. Mm -hmm. So it was in one of those cases, I could actually, for example, put my gravity gloves up close to my face, and I could even read out the microchip text that was on the PCB board, right, that was on the gravity gloves. That was a level of detail, I think. I think that's dependent on your eyes, because I'm 10 years older than you, not so much on my end. And art assets in the world, in VR, we are scrutinizing things more. You're picking up things, exploring. So even picking up magazines, newspapers, cans and Every bottles. Every object. All, there's so many objects in the world that are inter interactable, and it, you just want to pick them up and look at them. It's yeah, yeah. All, that, all the art assets look fantastic in this headset, as well as long distance encounters, seeing enemies, shooting zombies when they're across the room. No problem with dark areas. It, everything seemed to work reasonably well in terms of the headset. The, headset. the sound fidelity is great. One of the things that really became clear after using a lot of different headsets over a really short period of time, the headsets that ride on the top of your head versus the front of your head are much more comfortable, and, and the index is firmly in that camp. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, it is using SteamVR tracking, so no problems with the tracking volume, and that same goes for the controllers here that you have, mm -hmm. uh, which are unique to uh, the, the Valve Index. Well, not necessarily, because you can put them on the old HTC, sure. any, any of the, the Pimax, the HTC Vive, the Vive Pro, all of those, you can use the Knuckles controllers, the index yes. controllers. So the index controllers mm -hmm. offer some unique, uh, some unique interaction. Uh, you can, when you're doing things like doing a force pull, you reach out, you point, you highlight the object you want, you yank it back, and you can grip, you can trigger, you can do both, you can do either, they all work, which was really pleasant and made it much easier to do the grabs. That was interesting to me because you could use the, the trigger, mm -hmm. which all the other controllers have some type of analog trigger, mm -hmm. but here you could also release your hand completely as you're tossing a gas canister exactly. or something. And that throw felt very natural. So easy. Underhand lobs are simple. You can a, a lot of gameplay is involved in throwing things at things to distract them and make them do other things. I won't say anything specific, but it was really easy to do. You overhand throw. It usually goes where you want. Not every time, but more often than not. The thumbsticks are used for movement, mm -hmm. so you play with a teleportation scheme, mm -hmm. blinking around the room. Left stick forward opens the normal teleport menu that you see in every Valve game. You rotate to change your orientation inside that space. I found myself not really using quick turn at all in the VR, which is bound to the right stick. Uh, what I did find is when I did seated, quick turn was really important, obviously, because you don't want to get tangled up in cords as you're spinning around in an office, in a desk chair or something like that. And I used a free locomotion mode, mm -hmm. so my left stick was actually lateral traversal, oh. and so I did use a lot of quick turn. It's how I play a lot of VR games, and I was very comfortable in there, even though it's not as easy a problem, because you can vault onto tables. I was just saying, how does it handle going objects. up? Do you blink? Do you lerp? Is I it... think it's something that they're they're figuring out right now. It's right now because there's elevation mm -hmm. in the game. There's some moments where you don't physically climb a ladder. It will teleport you up there, right. but you also can drop into places. But you well. can climb up on top of desks and things yes. like that. You have full, you like, it's, I was stunned at the, the amount of space in the environment that you can get on top of. And, and obviously they're gonna block some of that stuff off to keep people from breaking the game. But you're very mobile in this game. A uh, big part of the game is combat and mm -hmm. puzzle solving. For that, they're focusing on two hand interaction. So if something like the pistol, you're reloading with two hands, which requires you to put your hand behind your back. You're then interfacing one hand with the other hand, dropping a magazine. Drop the mag, slam stop it the in, mag. release the slide either with the button or by pushing it from the back or the front of the gun. And I one. really like on the this index controller moving the slide, pulling the slide. You know, it was really, it, it never felt like the geometry of the controllers themselves got in the way of the hand models actually Absolutely. working. Uh, each of the guns has a little bit of a different reload mechanism. The Obviously the pistol has a clip that goes in the bottom. Shotguns, you pump shells into a, into a tube. I, I assume there's other guns further down the line. We didn't see any of those. But it's very satisfying. There's always some sort of physicality to the movement. It's really, really good. And 
while it's initially really daunting and challenging in combat, once you get going, it becomes second nature to drop the mag slam it and start keep keep popping zombies in the head. Yeah, so really happy with the experience with the Index headset and the controllers mm -hmm. as well. Let's move on to our next headset. So going into this, I was really curious about how Half-Life Alex would play on Oculus headsets. Right? Yeah. And right now you can buy the Oculus Rift S mm -hmm. as well as an Oculus Quest with the link cable. Uh, they both use inside-out tracking. They have different displays, um, and one renders uh, on the computer, while what they both run on the computer, but one also has the ergonomics of a computer inside the front with the Quest. And had some video compression between the video, the, the game, and the output on the display. They use the same controllers, though. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, do you want to start there with controllers, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's basically the same format that Oculus has used since the initial touch controllers. There's grabby buttons that are digital buttons, analog triggers. It's all capacitive. There's a couple of buttons on each controller and thumbsticks that are clicky on each controller. And it works shockingly well. Yeah. Um, the, the, it's the same scheme as on the index, motion on the left hand, quick turns on the right. You can do the teleport with the turn. You can do all the same motion that you do on all the other headsets. All, all the motions across all the headsets. So you can do continuous motion. I didn't actually, did you try that? Uh, free local motion? Yes. yes. Yeah, it worked Work really fine. well. Worked totally fine. Um, there are fewer buttons on top because there's no trackpad mm -hmm. like there is on the index controller. Which means gun selection is tied to a click on the right stick, which means that I fairly regularly would actually do a quick turn while I was trying to switch guns, which isn't ideal when you have the zombie chasing you, head carefully keeping at you, losing your orientation. If I was playing myself on, a, on the Rift or the Quest, I would probably use the Steam uh, controller binding stuff to just turn off quick turn, because I, I don't. I find myself rarely using it. Mm -hmm. And because there are capacitive buttons as well as a trigger and mm -hmm. grip, you get hand presence. A little bit. Yeah, you don't get individual finger tracking, so you can't do you know, but, that but you pose. But you get this. You, you, get, you can make finger guns and you can do thumb stuff. And that's not essential to the game as far as we can tell, so it's right. Throw, totally and, fine. And throwing worked. At the end of the day, what I was really worried about is, is the timing on throws right? Can I do an overhand throw where, where it's behind my head? And even on the inside out tracking headsets, behind the head work, even putting my hand back behind my body to, to teleport, to teleport back. backwards away from a monster, worked fine. Yeah, and also one of the things with the inside out tracking, because the camera is, has a tracking volume, is a little bit of a blind spot. Mm -hmm. you know, Oculus has done a lot of work this year in improving their algorithms, so even when you have a controller really up close, which I was doing as I was looking down doing the, the sites, right. exactly, uh, you, I still got lateral movement, I didn't have Inclusion problems where the controllers and the hands were jumping all over the place. Uh, the display on the Rift S mm -hmm. looked really great to me. It's again an LCD panel with RGB stripes, so details were there. Uh, and I could almost make out that text on the mm -hmm. microchip. I, the thing that shocked me about the Rift, the Oculus products is that the Quest worked as well as it did with the link cable, because it is compressing video on the machine, sending it across a USB 3 bus, so there's, there's compression and latency there. I didn't notice it. There was a, maybe a tiny bit of dithering in the, in the darker areas where the blacks were kind of getting lost in the compression, but it looked really good. So that's an OLED panel here, mm -hmm. and technically it has the same resolution in the Quest as the Index and the Vive Pro, uh, but it's using a pentile subpixel arrangement. So it actually, the details are a little bit lost. You don't get as, I could not read, read that text, text okay. as well. I didn't notice any latency, but I did notice the compression. There are volumetric smoke effects in, in this game. You know, we're walking through train stations and there's this fog, low this fog. fog and haze. And those type of gradients in that really suffer uh, when being converted through a compression algorithm. And so that's, those are the things where I felt like, even though it's an OLED, the low black levels, I didn't get all the benefits of that here. So we played that on a 1080 machine. I wonder if the RTX cards with better video compression would produce better results. From my understanding, it's all the same across right now. It okay. does not scale, so that is what it is. Also, uh, you did this with the stock Quest head strap, yeah. uh, as well as a standard, like, uh, Three meter cable mm -hmm. that you can buy uh, on Amazon. Amazon. Or a ten foot one, yeah. Exactly. Uh, how, what was your experience? It with was that? uncomfortable. I mean, it was fine for short periods of time. By the time I reached thirty or forty minutes, my my neck my neck is sore. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of it's from doing VR stuff all day, but it was it was a lot on the neck. It's very front heavy. Uh, I did try your Franken Quest, yes, which is a much more pleasant experience. Yes. Uh, also, in terms of audio. You know, the piped audio is fine for playing Beat Saber or something like that, but when you have positional sound, it wasn't the best sound that I heard today. 
Yeah, if someone's gonna play this with a quest, I would highly encourage it. Finger earbuds. Finger earbuds, and also figuring out either a counterweight system or looking into something like doing the Franken quest, mm -hmm. just for purely for comfort. Uh, I, I really, I, I spent, you know, good amount of time in that, and definitely more time in the Franken quest, and uh, this was so much more comfortable. I, all of the heads, like the big takeaway for me today is that the headsets that center the weight or put the weight further back are infinitely more comfortable than the front heavy one, front heavy headsets, to the point that like the Halo headsets, like the like the Windows MR headset, the Oculus uh, the Oculus Rift S, are both pr much much more comfortable. Anything that's putting weight on the front of your face is going to be really uncomfortable for a long session. And while the Quest does have more versatility in terms of if you want to play the Oculus games and the, the mobile games and not just do Link, that's there. But if you're just going to use it as a device to play PC games, I actually I think I prefer the the Rift S more because I, I like that RGB stripe panel, the tracking volume's a little bit better, and comfort-wise, out of the box, it's, it's much bit, better. Much better. Um, I, but, but that said, if you want to play, I think the Quest is entirely viable. Like I think in terms of control, you're not losing anything on control except for the, the analog squeeziness on a, a couple of kind of throw, like one-off objects for, for all intents and purposes. I, I really, I was shocked at how good the Quest was. So now we're on to uh, kind of the first gen VR product, starting with the HTC Vive. I don't know about you, this is the one I get questions. I get questions about this and the OG Rift yeah. more than anything else. Right. So we're not worried about tracking here. It's still using the same Steam VR Lighthouse based tracking system. Mm -hmm. And so all the performance that we had on the index controllers, that is inherited here. Yeah. Uh, what's different, of course, is there's a low resolution display. Mm -hmm. It's 2160 by 1200. It's an OLED panel, though. And in this case, even though it's a Penthouse subpixel arrangement, the I, I found it, it looked great. Surprisingly good. Yeah, really good. Dark was dark dark areas were great. You had really good contrast in the in between the dark and the light areas. I was able to read text on everything. I didn't have any problems using the iron sights. I was very pleasantly surprised. I mean, no surprise that I can't read the microchip text mm -hmm. here, but encounters with enemies near and far, you know, trying to snipe them from afar with a pistol through the headset here, felt really good um, with this display. And we were using the Pro Audio strap attached to the, the original Vive. It was very comfortable. I have to imagine if you're using the old elastic strap, probably not a great experience. Yeah, that's the upgrade recommendation I would yeah. make for this as well for the audio quality as well as the long-term comfort. Yeah. Now, in terms of the controllers, this is where it gets a little trickier. Yeah, so this is the simplest controller that we, that we use today. Um, basically, you have grip button down here, the top and bottom, the, the touchpad, and then the trigger. Uh, so teleport forward and back moves uh, is on the, the touchpad on the left controller, quick turn right and left on the right controller. Also, you have to click down in the center of the pad to get the weapon change menu. So you're in the situation where you frequently quick turn. I, I would, again, probably disable that if I was using teleport and use the rotational teleport, because that works really well. Um, reloads are on the grip. Uh, it's a grip to drop the mag, the top menu button to release the slide. I found myself actually using the slide forward, uh, with the grabbing the top of the slide with my, with my offhand, except yeah, this is one of these together. cases where just the, the tracking puck on top of the wand here, mm -hmm. it doesn't match, there's nothing for that represented in the game, so I am banging against them when I want to do that smooth muscle memory yeah. reload, uh, so you're better off actually just pressing the button to release the slide in this case. And the button is in an awkward position, unfortunately. I, if, I, if I had an OG Vive, I think the headset's more than capable, especially if you have the Pro Audio strap. I would probably think about buying a set of knuckles. They'll work with your existing lighthouse. You know, it's a, they're they're fairly expensive controllers, but they add a ton to the game. So. You know, one benefit I did really enjoy about using the Vive Wands mm -hmm. is the the grip. You know, the, the pistol grip uh, felt good. You know, it's this is controller designed less for hand presence about the ergonomics of your resting hand pose than what it is to hold something that's like the hilt of a, the, 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 of a sword or or the pistol grip of a pistol. And in this case, manipulating that pistol in my hand with this controller 
felt really good. I, and I have to say the throws were fantastic. So uh, unlike the, the hands that have analog grip or even the, the Oculus controllers that have a digital touch button, a grip button, you mostly use the trigger to, to yank things over to you and then you release and release the trigger. And that motion felt really good. Uh, things went where I expected them to. Like it, it's an entirely viable way to play the game. I think you get a pretty big upgrade from Knuckles. Of course, the HTC Vive isn't a product people can really buy new today because HTC has replaced that with the Vive Cosmos, which is different from the Vive, completely not using the Steam VR beacon, Lighthouse beacons. It uses inside out tracking, mm -hmm. as well as has a completely different uh, controller design. Yeah. What did you feel about this? Uh, so I thought the headset was fine. It's comfortable. The sound is, is, is very comparable to the Pro Audio Strap on the original Vive or the Vive Pro. It's a very high resolution display. The screen looks great. Mm -hmm. uh, the tracking on the hands was a little hinky in my, it was probably the least reliable of all the things that we tried today, yeah. including the other inside out tracking solutions like the Windows MR headset and the and the new riffs. So um, basically the thing that I found is that anytime you've got the controllers up in front of your face, so if you're doing a John Wick kind of close aim, you're gonna lose tracking and one or both of the hands will fly off in different directions, which is not great. Um, moving back behind your, your hand to teleport worked fairly reliably, however, when you brought your hand back forward, it would often skip through space. So you lose a lot of the hand presence it's not terrible, but if you if you don't have one of these already, you're probably not in the market for this headset. Is my right, guess. that's what I think. And, yeah. and if you do have one, it's playable. It might just change the way you approach some of the encounters to have to work around the limitations. You'll, of you'll think about it. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is the, the controller doesn't have a touchpad, so it's only sticks. So you're in the same situation as you are with the original Vive wand, where your quick turns and your weapon selection menu are bound to the same stick. And it's easy to, to hit the button and, Accidentally. and do quick turns by accident when you're trying to change guns. That's right, which yeah. you don't want in, no, it's bad. You don't in want a combat that. situation. No. Another headset that is classified like the first gen of VR that a lot of people may currently have mm -hmm. is the very first Oculus Rift, the CV1. Uh, and this one uses an outside-in tracking system. We tested in this case with two cameras, not the three camera, full 360 setup. And as you can see, we also tested it while sitting down. I was shocked at how playable the game is sitting. Uh, you know, there's some binding changes that happen when you're sitting. You want to use quick turns more than physically spinning the chair. A, so you don't get tangled up in the cables, but B, with Rift, you have to stay facing forward and facing the cameras the entire time, which was the biggest challenge of the Rift. The controller uh, maps exactly the same as the Quest and the Rift S. It has more or less the buttons you need. It has the right thumbstick issue where you do need to use the same button to do quick turns and, and weapon selection, but you know, it worked, it worked reasonably well. And the position of the tracking ring, I didn't felt like got in the way of the two-handed dexterity. No, you, you could rack, rack guns, no problem. You could hold them right up on your face because you're not obstructing any of the tracking stuff when yeah. you do that. The big surprise for me was how good it looked in headset. And I forgot how comfortable this headset is. It like, feels so light. It does feel so light. It essentially is the same type of panel and optics as what you'd find on the HTC Vive, mm -hmm. different degrees of the God Rays, for example. But but uh, I really enjoyed playing on the original Rift, and I, I could go for a long time in this because of the head strap design and because of the relatively low weight. The thing that surprised me, I'd forgotten how boomy the headphones are compared to the Pro Audio strap and the Index. It is a very bassy headphone compared to the other, the other options out there. Another option in the VR headset world is Windows Mixed Reality. There's a lot of Windows Mixed Reality headsets. They're all more or less the same. Uh, we're actually using the Samsung one, which is, I think, the high end of the Windows Mixed Reality world. Yep, yep. Um, but this is the category of headset that you could probably, would be the cheapest way for you to get into desktop PC VR, because we see them on sale all the time. $150, $200 for the Lenovo HP headsets, that's crazy. Right, uh, what's shared between them is inside out tracking. And in this case, uh, inside tracking was really good. It worked really well. Um, I was pleasantly surprised. I didn't notice any drops on the on the hand tracking, either up and, up and behind my, the front of my face, down and back to teleport away from monsters. It all worked fine. Uh, I did notice some problems when you got up close with two hands, but that's kind of to be expected. It didn't keep me from playing the game. It just meant that I'm, if I'm John Wicking, instead of being right here, I'm gonna be out a few inches. Right, uh, the controller is the thing that we have in the past been the least happy with, with the Windows Mixed Reality world. And it's in this case, it, again, it's fine, but it bumps into, the, the, this tracking ring is so big that it just collides You can't slide. Everywhere. I mean, 
this is the best of the Windows MR controllers that I've used. I, I, this one feels sturdy in your hand. It has the trackpad, it has the button, so you don't have the problem where you're, where you're actually losing, in, inadvertently turning when you're trying to load guns or switch weapons. Um, I, I thought this was, I, I, this is one of my more, more preferred ways to play. Yeah, it just doesn't offer me, for me, the, the hand presence aspect if I'm looking and pointing and gesturing at things, um, as well as I just don't like the fact that this ring gets in the way when I'm trying to do two-handed dex dexterous moves. I'll take, hand, I'll take uh, comfort with the ring design on the headset over hand presence and smashing the rings together all day long. And then we're gonna conclude with an outlier case a little bit, but this is the Pimax 5K. Uh, and a bunch of people bought into this with the promise of an ultra wide field of view. You can tell that they use, in this case, two very high resolution panels. Uh, they put them sideways instead of up and down. That's right. And then they have their special lenses that then let you take advantage of those panels. But the game has to run through some special software. So Steam VR is telling the headset, okay, we're gonna try to maximize the field of view. It's actually rendering, I think, the same resolution, and then the Pimax software does its magic to get it to fill that field of view, which from my perspective, uh, looked like they just kind of zoomed into the world a little bit and then cropped off the top and bottom. Hmm. And so I wasn't getting any extra information off the side. It's certainly not something Valve is designed for, for it, this field of view. It definitely, the, the center field of view for me, like the center cone where you're looking through like the diver's mask of a traditional VR headset seemed fine. Uh, the more you got to the edges, the more things looked stretchy and weird on occasion. And when you would move your hands in and out to see what happened, then the, it, it was, it, it, this is my first time using the Pimax. It wasn't at all what I was expecting. The one thing I will say about it is the comfort was really high. Even with a non-rigid head strap, just an elastic head strap, it was really comfortable for the entire play session I was in for. It's a lighter headset than it looks, given that there's two big panels here. Yeah. Uh, but you do have to bring your own headphones, mm -hmm. and you also bring your own controllers. In this case, the Valve Index controllers, because it is just Steam VR. So like the Vive, you can just adapt those, and you get all the benefits. Knuckles or Vive ones, or presumably their own controllers. We didn't test those. That's right. So, well, at the end of this day, we've now played Half-Life Alex on a bunch of VR headsets. What's our big takeaway? It's, it's awesome on everything. Like, I had fun playing on almost every piece of hardware we tested, from the original first-generation headsets, the, the OG Vive with the wands. It works great. You know, it, it looks great, it works great, it sounds really good with the Pro Audio strap. I was blown away. I mean, part of the thing was that I was wondering is, did they design this to work exclusively with the benefits of the Index headset and Index controllers? And controllers specifically, because there's so much more input on those controllers. It seems like they haven't. They've done a bunch of work to adapt the things that you can do in game to work on all these other controllers. And in fact, it's more the physical design of the other controllers that got in the way of me playing the game. With the Vive Wands, the tracking being on top, so I couldn't do that muscle memory reload mechanic. You love to rack. Yeah, the same with the Windows Mixed Reality controller. Uh, but in terms of uh, fidelity of play, you know, even with something like the original Vive or the Rift the C CV1, the lower resolution of those panels was totally fine. I was really pleased with how good the game looked in there. For, for me, the big takeaway was breaking out movement on the right, right hand, movement and weapon selection on the right hand. You know, when you're trying to select a gun, I've said this a bazillion times today, it feels like, when you try to select the gun and turn, lose your orientation and can't find the monster you're shooting at, right. that's not a great experience. And I think the first thing I'll do if I'm playing on one of those headsets is disable the, the quick turn on the right hand. And that's a, a, that's a result of the index and some of the other controllers having two modes of basically a directional movement on the top of the controller, right. uh, whereas the original Vive and even the Oculus Rift, they don't have that. And so that's, I think, the only concession they had. But things like the gravity gloves and the firing models, near field shooting, the tracking stuff, very pleased with this. Um, and that's good news for people who have VR headsets today. Like, I, I really, I would play on almost everything we tested today. Not so much a fan of the Cosmos. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, there'll be more that we'll be talking about and sharing about the Half-Life Alex experience as Val was ready to talk about that. I think we can say we film more here than we're showing right now. So stay tuned on Tested for those conversations and those discussions. And thanks for watching. Bye, everybody.